Chicago Sky second round pick and Gonzaga guard Brenna Maxwell joins the show today to discuss her reaction to getting picked in the WNBA draft and what she brings to Chicago. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Well, folks, Aiden Mahaney is in the transfer portal out of St. Mary's, a stunning development for Randy Bennett and the Gales. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about a Gonzaga walk-on who is also in the transfer portal to close out the show. But first, fantastic conversation coming your way with Brenna Maxwell, who is the 13th player selected in the 2024 WNBA draft by the Chicago Sky. We'll talk to Brenna about her reaction to getting selected, uh, the comparison with Courtney Vandersloot, who is also coming out of Gonzaga and selected by the Chicago Sky, and some of Brenna's thoughts on this incredible season for Lisa Fortier and the Gonzaga women basketball team. Well, I'm incredibly thrilled to be joined today by Brenna Maxwell. Just finished up her incredible two-year career with the Gonzaga Bulldogs and was selected 13th overall in the 2024 WNBA draft by the Chicago Sky. Brenna, thank you so much for taking time out of what I imagine is a very hectic schedule right now to come on and and talk about getting that call and uh, your last season at Gonzaga. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's an exciting time. I can't imagine. So I think starting with, I just want to hear what was getting that call like, like what was the experience had, had they, had you had contact with Chicago prior to that? Were you expecting it kind of what, what was that process like when, uh, when you found out uh, on, I guess it was on Monday. Yeah. um, I had talked to Chicago's GM before and Mm -hmm. um, had a good conversation. And then I actually didn't watch the draft. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just, in the gym, listening to worship music and just kind of, I don't know, just hanging out. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, it was like six ish. And I was like, well, I'm going to text my dad Mm because I think the draft's probably almost over. (laughs) It wasn't. And I was like, I just want to know when it's over so I can just go back to my parents' house. Mm -hmm. And then I get a call from my agent and he's like, he's got pick 13th by the Chicago sky. And I was like, (laughs) and like sprinted out of there. And um, then the sky called me and it's here we are. Mm -hmm. What was, what was their conversation with you? Like, did they tell you what kind of role they're envisioning for you? Is that coming down the pipeline? I know we're like not even 24 hours removed from, from that initial call, but kind of have have they identified like what, what role they might envision for you or kind of what, what made them choose you at 13th? Yeah. um, They envisioned me as a specialist off the move shooter. Those are the Mm -hmm. words they use. And they said there's a need for that in their team. Um, and there's obviously no guarantees. I got to beat some people out for a spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where training camp comes in. So the hard part starts now. The easy part is getting drafted. Um, but you know, they, they were confident in me and they believed in me and that, that means a lot. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. At, we'll see what happens next. How, how are you feeling going into that? I, I know again, emotions must just be at an all time level, uh, just, just from getting that call and kind of knowing things are about to change with training mm-hmm. camp coming up and, and everything. Are, are you feeling prepared, ready? Are you kind of just, where, where's your head at after, after a, a whirlwind 24 hours? Yeah. Um, I've been working out pretty hard for the past week and a half or so, just since the season ended. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm feel pretty confident in that area and feel like I'm in shape and, my shot's feeling good. Um, and then they kind of said what they expected me from camp. So um, I'm just going to go in. I've talked to a lot of, I'm really blessed to be part of a staff, um, have a staff that's has experience. They've been to training camp, so they kind of were filling me in on what I should expect. So obviously it's my first one. I'm not hundred percent sure what's, what's going to happen, but I think I'm as prepared as I can be going in. Gonzaga was one of six schools to have two players selected in this WNBA draft. Obviously, your teammate, Kaylin Trung, getting selected eight spots later, I believe, 21st overall by Washington. What, what do you think? For, first of all, let's talk about her and, and her getting picked and, and what your emotions were like getting to see one of your teammates and, and somebody you've played with for the last couple of years also get picked in the WNBA draft. 
Yeah, I think I was, <laughs> might have been more excited to see her name pop up. <laughs> I almost started crying. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh. And I immediately texted her. Um, but it's, it's so cool to share that with someone. And mm -hmm. it's, I'm excited to see what happens with her. Um, I know that's a dream come true for her as well. Mm -hmm. And she's just such an amazing player and amazing person. I don't think anyone deserves this more than she does. It feels like for, for Gonzaga to have had two players selected and obviously to have had, you know, the WCC player of the year and Yvonne Ejim not be among those two players as she's coming back to Spokane for next year. Like for Gonzaga, I think a lot of the conversation around this team that, that at least I've been perpetuating and a lot of others is that they were kind of underappreciated throughout the year. You know, they played in a in a conference where I think that they weren't getting as much love. This team didn't get as much love as they should have. But obviously, if the WNBA is viewing two of these players, you, you and Kaylin, as, as two of the top 20, top 21 players uh, in the draft process, like clearly the scouts and everybody loved what they saw out of this team. How how did you feel kind of going through this season and, and you know, the, having the the, the dominance, I mean, unbelievable levels of dominance in conference play uh, and kind of feeling like the, the perception of the team versus how talented you knew that the group you had was going in. Like, did you feel like there was a disconnect there? And did you feel like like this uh, this draft kind of helped validate some of that? I think um, there was a di there's a difference between what the media covers mm -hmm. and sure. what the scouts look at. And mm -hmm. I think this, there's a reason – the scouts are the ones that get paid to do their job sure. and they, they aren't reporting on the mm -hmm. five people all year, same five people a year. Mm -hmm. um, they do their homework because their jobs and careers are on the line. Yeah. Um, and not saying the media isn't great. I think it is a great job helping women's basketball get mm -hmm. coverage, but there is a little bit of a disconnect there when it comes to some of the teams that aren't in these major conferences. But I do think um, there were a lot of scouts at a lot of our games and because we had such an amazing roster and yeah. there's going to be them next year too because of mm -hmm. people on the team coming back and um i just think it's really cool that it is kind of validating that mm -hmm. um like yeah we, we we are we were a good we're a good team and um maybe it might have put a little bit of a little more respect on gonzaga's mm -hmm. name Brenna talks about this team's dominant regular season and what it meant to host a pair of games in the ncaa tournament and we're going to get to all of that in just a second Right after I tell you that today's episode is sponsored by Yahoo Finance. Wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investment and retirement accounts in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis that you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. I used to try to do this all on my own self-made spreadsheet, and it was so much time, so much energy, and way too much trouble. So I recently switched to using today's sponsor, Yahoo Finance, and I've never looked back. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or are looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data that you need in one place. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. The number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. Once again, that is yahoofinance.com. Let's talk about the season that we just saw for this team, because I think for a while, the closest margin of victory in the conference play was 18 points. There was a 60 point victory, multiple 30 point victories, uh, just an absolutely dominating stretch of basketball from from this entire team. I mean, not mm -hmm. just the starting lineup, not just Yvonne and yourself and the twins like there was excellent play from everybody top to bottom on this roster throughout the season. And and I've watched a lot of great Gonzaga basketball in my life on both the men's side and the women's side. And there have been dominant seasons in conference play in Gonzaga basketball history, but that was like just a whole nother level. How did, how did, what allowed you to continue to play at that level throughout the season? Like there never seemed to be dips or lulls or like, you know, it's hard to turn up day in and day out, even when you have the talent level to beat teams the way that you guys were beating them to, to do it consistently. I think to me is a testament to an excellent disciplined team and a coaching staff, but what, what do you think allowed your team to be that dominant uh, pretty much from the opening game of the season all the way through, through to the end there? Yeah. You kind of touched on it a little bit. I think of a couple things. Um, first, I think we 
we're full of just seniors and fifth years and mm -hmm. that kind of experience there isn't a lot of dips because everyone's kind of seen it all, been through it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there for half a decade, there's a lot of things that happen. Um, mm -hmm. But also all the team, basically the entire team came back from yeah. that previous year and we ended in a way that we did not want to end. And that left mm -hmm. a really better taste in our mouths. And we used that as motivation throughout the entire year. We talked about it the entire year. And then I think our staff just did an amazing job of setting goals within the goal. So like, yeah, we're probably going to win this game, but mm -hmm. we have some goals we need to meet so we can take this program to an even higher level. So we yeah. had like defensive goals, offensive goals, and that kind of, that kept us motivated when we were up big, like to keep pushing and keep the foot on the gas throughout the entire conference. And um, I'm really proud of what our team did because it was a really special group. And you got to earn a, a chance to host NCAA yeah. tournament games, which is just an incredibly cool thing as the first time uh, that I think in like 10 years or so that, that Gonzaga was able to do that. And the opportunity to to win a pretty big game against a team that I have a feeling meant a little bit more to you to get that W against in Spokane. What, what was that that like getting that uh, Sweet 16 vic or that victory to go into the Sweet 16? Yeah, that might have been the best week of my entire life. <laughs> the best from, from the selection show to mm – -hmm going to Portland was probably the best block of time in my entire life. And I shared it with my best friends who made it even more special. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was what we prepared for all year. So we were just kind of locked in going in and it was really special to have the fan base come out and support. I can still see that entire, those two games, the entire game, just in the memories of seeing all the fans out there and um, all the joy that came mm -hmm. from that. And I'm, I'm really glad we got to kind of show the world Spokane a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Just seeing the the after that game, the the team running out into the crowd and kind of celebrating with everybody was just a really cool moment. And I think highlights what what maybe a lot of people who aren't kind of really built into the Gonzaga basketball don't necessarily understand that family atmosphere, that mm -hmm. closeness that the players and the fans uh, and everybody kind of have in, in the in the kennel and to see that kind of play out the way that it did with everybody out there and celebrating and just loving life. Like it was a really cool experience. And I think like, like I said, highlighted kind of what makes Gonzaga basketball so special and what made this particular group with so many players who were, like you said, fifth years and in their final year and knew this is it, this is the time for us to do it. And to have been able to get it done and advance to the sweet 16, just a really powerful moment. I thought. Yes, for sure. It was it was something I'm going to tell my kids about. <laughs> <laughs> um, want to talk a little bit more broadly, just women's basketball in general, because I think it's been a, a huge discourse this year in particular. Uh, the the strength of college basketball in terms of like some of those you know media numbers, the the TV views, things like that, uh, highlighted obviously in a lot of ways by Caitlin Clark and that Iowa team. And but there was a lot of attention on LSU and Kim Mulkey and the South Carolina team and their undefeated season and and just so many other players, Juju Watkins at, at USC and et cetera. And, and we feel, we feel like we're hitting a point where women's basketball is, is kind of starting to push into that point where they're, they're getting that attention and we're seeing the the media back it up and, and actually start to, to kind of push this, this narrative forward and, and put it at the forefront. Because when, when it's on TV, when people, when there, it is being shown and it is being kind of advertised, people are very clearly watching it uh, for you you know, as somebody who's played college basketball for the last five years and is now going out into the WNBA, what does it mean to you to see this sport kind of growing at the level it is while still acknowledging that there is, there's still plenty of more growth to be had? Yeah. I, I think it's really cool that the media is finally realizing how people will watch mm -hmm. um, when they put things on TV when they put things on networks and they advertise people will watch. And there mm -hmm. was, you know, this isn't a comparison to men's and women's, but there were, mm -hmm more viewers watching the yeah. women's championship than the men, um, <laughs> which is just crazy because mm -hmm. this is like the first time they've really advertised for it and really put it on a pedestal a little bit. And people came in swarms yeah. and there's a lot of um, trailblazers out there, like, you know, Angel Reese, Caitlin mm -hmm. Clark, um, all those people, they're, they're, they're doing a great job of bringing in fans and um, hoping the media expands um, that even more because there's so many great players out there. Yeah. Um, 
for Gonzaga next year, obviously you're out the door. The Twins are out the door. A handful of other players departing. It's going to be a, a more new look team than we're used to from last year, where, like you said, basically everybody came back from the previous season. Uh, who, are, who are some players that you can tell us right now that, that we should be watching for, whether they're incoming players or current players on the roster who just didn't get a lot of playing time last year because uh, of how many of those veterans were still in the mix? Like who, who, who Who's a, a name for Gonzaga fans who are getting ready for the next season to, to keep an eye on? There's a couple of post players. Um, of course, Yvonne Ejim. You know, of course. I think the public knows about her. But um, Maud Hybens, mm -hmm. uh, she's going to be an incoming senior, and she's a 6'5 post player who every offseason she improves so much. And she took such a leap this season. I think she's going to take another one by the way she's been working out. Um, and then we have another. She's a freshman post from mm -hmm. New Zealand, Lauren Whitaker. She came in at Christmas and redshirted, so no one's really seen her play, but she is super dynamic, can honestly probably play the three through five. She's big body. Um, she is a high IQ. Um, she is, I think Zach Nation is going to love her. So those are the two that top of my head, but I think we're in a couple of transfers. Esther Little is coming back. She's, she's an upperclassman. Um, just hold down the defensive end. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, it's going to be a new team with a new identity, but I think it's going to be the same as Gonzaga basketball. Yeah, it seems like one of the things that Coach Fortier has always been fantastic at is just next person up. You know, as we've seen from sixth woman of the year to all WCC first, first team has been like a pipeline the last couple of years with Melody and then with Yvonne and hopefully with uh, Mount as well. I, I think mm -hmm. they're in a really good spot with that with that team. So I wanted to ask you this earlier. I forgot to mention it. Um, there's another player who played high school basketball on the west side of the state of Washington, who then played at Gonzaga, who then got drafted by the Chicago Sky. Her name's Courtney Vandersloot. Most of you have probably heard of her. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the most prolific women's basketball players of all time. Um, did you? Did, was that a connection that you thought of when you got drafted by Chicago? Have you heard from, from her or anybody else who's maybe kind of involved in that pipeline at all? Because it's, it's kind of a fun connection to have. Yeah. Honestly, I didn't even think about it until a couple hours later. I'm like, oh, <laughs> who's number 22, too? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. why? Um, she hasn't reached out, um, mm -hmm. but I know she's really supportive. Um, mm -hmm. Chicago Sky said they've talked to her. My head coach has talked to her. Yeah. Um, she's obviously a Chicago Sky Gonzaga legend, now New mm -hmm. York legend. Um, but it's cool to kind of ca carry on the tradition of being drafted by the Sky and mm -hmm. <laughs> wonder who's next. Yeah, exactly. Um, last thing for you, Brenna, before I let you go, um, for Chicago Sky fans who are listening, I know you mentioned what role the Sky are kind of envisioning for you, but what would you want them to know about who you are as a player, as a person, like as they're kind of getting to know the newest players, the newest draft picks for this team? Like what, what makes you uh, a person that they are going to be a big fan of uh, going forward? Yeah, I think something that they can't really look at on film is – um, how competitive I am. Mm -hmm. I think people have mentioned it before, but I hate losing in literally anything. Sometimes I'm walking through the airport and I'm like, I got to catch this person in front of me. So it's <laughs> like, it's just kind of a makes me tick. And mm -hmm. um, I think I can bring that to the Chicago sky as well. And I also think um, I work really hard and mm -hmm. a lot of people say that, but um, I don't like getting outworked. And so I will do my best to be the first one there. Last one to leave. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited for you too, Brennan. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, congratulations once again on getting selected. WNBA draft, that's a tremendous, huge accomplishment. Incredibly well-deserved. Looking forward to seeing what's next for you. Thanks, Andy. St. Mary's guard Aiden Mahaney shockingly entered the transfer portal, and we have our first zag in the transfer portal as well. We're going to get to all of that in just a second. Right after I tell you that today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Folks, I've been told I'm a competitive person. And let's be honest, it's true. I have a competitive side, as we all do. And I'm on my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It has been downloaded over 150 million times. It is a great twist on Monopoly, where you play on not one, but hundreds of different Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. 
You can team up with friends and, and people all around the world in times tournaments to earn yourself huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. All right, folks, segment three, still Andy Patton here, still locked on Zach's podcast, pivoting away from our fantastic conversation with Brenna Maxwell, the newest member of the Chicago Sky in the WNBA, and instead talking about a shocking development that we learned about on Tuesday evening. Aiden Mahaney, the star point guard for Randy Bennett and the St. Mary's Gales the past two seasons, has put his name into the NCAA transfer portal. And look, at this point it takes a lot to be shocked by something happening in the transfer portal. The same day, like an hour later, Jeremy Roach, the final remaining player from Duke who played for Mike Krzyzewski and John Shire, a four-year starter for the premier program in college basketball, the Blue Devils of Duke, Jeremy Roach entered his name in the transfer portal. So at this point, there just is not a lot of things that really surprise you. But Aiden Mahaney is a shock. Two-year starter for Randy Bennett and the Gales from the Moraga area. He's a local kid. He wanted to play at St. Mary's. It felt like a really nice kind of, I don't want to say gift for Randy Bennett because you still have to recruit players, but they were able to sell him on staying home and playing in this in, in, in his home area and getting this opportunity. And he's thrived for two years in Moraga. He's been really good. He struggled a little bit at the start of this last season. But he has been a really good player for a top 20 team in college basketball, a team that has earned a five seed in each of the last two years. I don't know how many opportunities are out there for Aiden Mahaney to be the primary ball handler and starting point guard for a team as good as St. Mary's. And to be able to do that in your hometown, it just feels like this was a really, really good situation for both St. Mary's and for Aiden Mahaney. But now he looks for another opportunity. As I'm recording this right now, he released a statement like they always do with, you know, how tough of a decision this was. And he talked to his family and he thanked the Gales Nation or whatever, like the same kind of statement that everybody's releasing. I don't know if he is considering coming back to St. Mary's at all, if that ship has sailed. It did not indicate that he is planning to enter the NBA draft. I don't think that that is part of it. So we're kind of just left wondering what is the plan here? Is there a plan? Was there some kind of quote unquote tampering, which there just not really is any policing in that regard right now? Uh, does he have an idea where he wants to go? Because this feels like a, a surprising one in the sense that, again, it's it's difficult to imagine Mahaney finding a better situation than what he has at St. Mary's. And it's not like that was threatened. For this upcoming season, Augustus Marcelonis is coming back. Mahaney and Marcelonis was expected to be the starting backcourt alongside center Mitchell Saxon. We knew they were losing Alex Dukas to graduation. Joshua Jefferson has already entered the transfer portal. Mason Forbes is out of eligibility, but the expectation was that the core three of Marcelonis, Mahaney, and Saxon were all going to be together. They were going to kind of put some pieces around them. They got a solid incoming class of freshmen coming in, and they were kind of still expected to – to stay in the mix, to be competing with Gonzaga, competing with Washington State and San Francisco for a top spot in the NCAA or in the WCC, likely getting an at-large bid in the NCAA tournament. And now that's kind of thrown into turmoil. When you lose your starting point guard and your starting power forward, as well as your starting small forward in Dukas to graduation, this is a really big blow for St. Mary's. And I think it could be part of a larger conversation about the transfer portal that I'm not sure we're ready to have yet because we're still kind of letting all of the, the pieces fall where they will. But the, the transfer portal is impacting mid-major programs and conferences in an incredibly significant way. And to see it impact a program like St. Mary's, which seemed somewhat impervious to this prior, prior to kind of seeing Mahaney and Jefferson enter the portal, it felt like, well, it's impacting mid-major programs that maybe don't have a lot of success or are, you know, are, aren't kind of ascended beyond that level. And it hasn't impacted Gonzaga all that much. Obviously, last year, we saw a trio of players enter the portal uh, in Hunter Salas, Dominic Harris, and Efton Reed. But they weren't starters. Outside of Salas, they weren't big-time contributors. And Salas felt like he deserved to play more, and there was justified reasons for him feeling that way. And while it sucks that he transferred and that he had the success that he had, I mean, it doesn't suck for him. It's great for him. We're celebrating Hunter Salas and his success at Wake Forest. But it was hard for Gonzaga to see that and for fans to see that. But we haven't lost starters. 
the way that St. Mary's just got gashed with Jefferson and Mahaney entering the portal. And the NIL is obviously a factor here. How much? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. But St. Mary's is a small institution. They don't have a huge donor base. They don't have a huge fan base. They don't have a huge alumni base because it's not a big school. And so I think that they are probably really struggling to keep up with the NIL era. I think a lot of the things that people assume about Gonzaga, and look, Gonzaga's NIL is probably not, I mean, it's definitely not at the level that some of these big programs are at. It's just not. There's no way that it is. They have found ways to succeed despite that being a a potential hurdle for them. And I think that they're bringing in more money than St. Mary's is. But St. Mary's does is not able to, clearly not able to find ways around that in the way that you would expect them to with these losses. Now, the other big story here is, of course, Justin Joyner, the associate head coach for Randy Bennett and the Gales. He's been the associate head coach since 2022. He's been an assistant uh, in Moraga since 2017. He left to take the associate head coach job behind Dusty May at Michigan. And that happened not that long ago. Joyner was responsible for recruiting Mahaney to St. Mary's. So his departure to a premier program with a big old bag of money, the Michigan Wolverines, suddenly followed with Aiden Mahaney entering the portal. It is not too hard to put two and two together. I don't know if Aiden Mahaney will start at Michigan. It certainly depends how the rest of this offseason goes for Dusty May and his staff. If they get John L. Davis his FAU star player at FAU with Dusty May. If he comes over to Michigan, if they find some other big names in the portal, Mahaney could end up coming off the bench if he goes to Michigan. But the money is better there. There's no way that Aiden Mahaney going to Michigan wouldn't make him more money than he is making at St. Mary's. And that kind of sucks. Like there's just, I mean, it's unfortunate. Again, we're, we're just, we're speculating here. We don't know if Aiden Mahaney is leaving primarily for NIL reasons, if he does want to follow his associate head coach to Michigan, if he's, there's been tampering. We don't know any of that. What we know is that the player who, or the coach who recruited Mahaney to St. Mary's went to Michigan and Mahaney entered the portal. That's what we know. And we project, speculate, assume that there is more. I mean, we know there's more money in Michigan than St. Mary's. We don't know if they're offering him more money necessarily, but we're starting to feel like St. Mary's is not able to keep up in the way that we that we would have thought they might. And this isn't good for Gonzaga. I know it's kind of fun to laugh at St. Mary's. They're the rival. They beat us last year. Uh, Aiden Mahaney is not a particularly fun player to play against and, and not having to play him going forward is not a bad thing for Gonzaga. But this happening to St. Mary's is not good. It's not good for Gonzaga. It's not good for the WCC. It's not good for college basketball. I think that's a reasonable take to have. The solutions, I don't have them. I'm I'm willing to speculate on some. I'm willing to have those conversations later in the offseason, either on this show or on Locked On College Basketball, because I think there are ways that this can be mitigated to not be like this. But it is not good for programs like St. Mary's to be losing their starting players in the transfer portal the way that they have. Wanted to end out the show here talking about Colby Brooks. Walk on for Gonzaga the last two years. Uh, He has entered the transfer portal. And this is somewhat similar to Will Graves when Will Graves entered the transfer portal, ended up transferring to a D3 school at Southern Oregon to be closer to his family, where, of course, his dad, Kelly Graves, is the head coach of the Oregon women's basketball team. And what I want to say here, first of all, happy for Colby Brooks. I I genuinely hope he finds a place to play where, where he gets actual playing time. He can contribute, whether that is at a lower level D1 school, whether it's D2, D3, NAIA, whatever it may be for Colby Brooks. But what I want to highlight here, and we can have a longer conversation about it, is when you see the inevitable boogeyman tweets about the transfer portal that you're going to see, 45% of the players who enter the transfer portal don't land at a D1 school or whatever shocking stat that they use that just seems too unrealistic to be true. Like there's no way that 2,000 Division I players are entering the transfer portal and 45% of them are not ending up at a D1 school. That just is not a real stat. It cannot be. Where What what would these rosters be made of? There's not 1,000 freshmen coming in every single year. So that data is just not particularly accurate. But part of it is because it's not factoring in the the attrition that happens naturally on college basketball rosters. Players like Colby Brooks, who walk on to a D1 program for a year or two, and then suddenly the next year, they're just not on the roster. And it's because they went down to a D3 level or they just quit playing basketball. I mean, this has happened at Gonzaga forever. I was friends with players where people were like, hey, that guy's on the basketball team. And then the next year, they were just not on the team anymore. They had walked on. They didn't play. Now they're just a regular student. This literally happens all the time at every school. 
But now those players enter the transfer portal, which is what they should do. Get their name out there, get some extra attention on them. But if you're doing that, and then you're you're deciding to go play D3 or NAIA or just decide, hey, I'm, I'm done playing. Whatever Colby Brooks decides, again, maybe he goes D1. But if he doesn't, he will be looked at as one of those stats that people use. Whereas like in any other year in the past, somebody like Colby Brooks just, you know, falling off of the roster and ending up somewhere else wouldn't have been a, a notable story. So that's where I, I caution to, to look at that data when you see it, when those tweets come out, when those posts come out, those articles, whatever, bashing the transfer portal. I'm not saying the transfer portal is not flawed. It very clearly is. But that data is always, always rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. And I, I'm using Colby Brooks as a bit of an example here. But like I said, I sincerely hope he finds a fun place to play. He scored 35 points in 22 games at Gonzaga, had 25 rebounds, was 52% shooter. Again, all of his playing time came in garbage time, of course. But fun player to have on the team, excited for him, hoping he finds a good landing spot for him in the future. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much to Brenna Maxwell for coming on the show. Thank you to all of you for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. We'll be back on Friday and then coming into next week as well, getting you ready with more transfer portal updates, recruiting updates, and continuing our season in review series as well. Thanks again. And until Friday, as always, go Zags.